everything we are, everything we have, everything we do, is because of him. Amen? That's a good thing, that is, not a bad thing. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm going to be reading this evening from a book in the Old Testament. And it's the book of Amos, chapter 8, and verses 11 to 14. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wonder, meaning the people shall wonder, from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manna of Beersheba liveth. Even they shall fall and never rise up again. Okay, there's just, the Lord will bless the reading of his word to us tonight. Okay, this is the story of uh, the children of Israel. and uh, God was sending a prophet to them, and his name was Amos. This story happened around about 750 years B.C. And this man, Amos, he was a shepherd. Sorry, an ordinary bloke, as it were. And he was called by God to be a prophet. We all know that there were priests and people who worked in the temple and, and did things like that. And more often than, than not, they were very intelligent people. They had uh, doctrines and learning and they were taught in the ways of the Lord. And God had indeed had raised up people like that for that job. But as Israel drifted further and further away from the Lord, God couldn't get through the priests, and so he had to raise up other people from here and from there, because God speaks through his body, doesn't he? He doesn't just speak through certain people. And if the priests weren't going to listen, well, then God was going to raise up a prophet from somewhere else. And this is how Amos appeared on the scene, as it were. Just an ordinary shepherd with no education about the things of God or anything like that, and yet God was able to get through to him. Doesn't it say in the New Testament that God chooses evil, the foolish things of the world? The world that this that world think, the people that this world think, are of no use or no value whatsoever. Well, we can't use you because you're of no worth, you're of no value. But God loves that. God says, okay, if the world will describe him, I'll have him. And God chooses, the Bible says, he chooses the foolish things. I look around at each other tonight, and God says that I've chosen you the foolish things of this world. How does that mean? <laughs> but he knows we are the foolish things of this world. We have been chosen by God. This world, in a sense, has discarded us. We are of no value to them, no use to them. But God says, I'll use you. And I'll take you, and I'll dust you off. I'll tidy away all the things, the blemishes that are not good in you, and I'll make you into something new. And I'll take you, and I'll use you. So what's Amos going to do then? Well, Israel at the time were outwardly prosperous. Everything seemed to be going fine in Israel. It says, in fact, that the, the people were, were lying down on ivory couches. Such was their industry and their prosperity in those days. Now, we all know that ivory always has been, and even is today, very precious and very costly. They're killing elephants all over the world, aren't they, for ivory today? Slaughtering innocent, innocent elephants just to get the tusks. You know, they can't just put them to sleep and get the tusks. They've got to slaughter them and kill them. And then they, they take the ivory. But such was the value of ivory that these people were making couches of them and lying down on them, as it, as it were. Such was the, the, the uh, abundance that they had in those days. Now, things might have been going all right on the outside, and things might have looked prosperous on the outside, but God always looks deeper than the outside, doesn't he? You know, he told the Pharisees, he said, you look good on the outside the inside, you're like dead men's bones. And that's what he was looking at Israel like at this time that Amos was a prophet. 
And yes, things may have been going well on the outside, but things weren't so good on the inside. The people who were leading the country weren't leading the country right. They weren't doing things which were correct. And they were leading Israel down paths that were not chosen by God. They were oppressing the poor. They were doing all kinds of things. They were worshipping pagan gods when God had told them not to do these things. Yet still they didn't listen and carried on in the way that they chose. We've only to look around our nation today that we're similar to what it was like in the days of Amos. Today we don't have ivory couches as such, but we have gated communities where the likes of you and I can't go. I've worked in these gated communities, so I know that they're there because I've worked in them. And there are gated communities scattered around the northwest here that you, you probably never even heard of. But you can't get into those gated communities unless you have a code or you've been authorized by the people who own the houses to get into that gated community. And the gap between rich and poor today in 2014 is probably just as wide as it was in Amos's day. We have the elite right at the top, separate from everybody else. So Amos' vision and uh, purpose from God was to warn the people of his coming judgment. Now God doesn't just get upset with his people and then judge them immediately. No, he doesn't do that. God doesn't work like that. God isn't like that. You and I sometimes are like that, aren't we? When somebody does us wrong or something, we want to strike back immediately, don't we? And hurt people for, for doing us wrong or doing us down or doing a bad turn. But God's not like that. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger and also quick to death, as we all know. We've only to look back through the scriptures and realize that even in the days of Noah, God was patient with the people. Yes, he was going to judge the world for the things that were going on, but he waited 120 years before he poured out his judgment upon a world where angels were coming down from heaven and coming and mingling themselves with mankind. You know, the offspring were called the Nephilim. But God warned them told them that the things that they were doing were wrong and he said he was going to bring his judgment but he was patient waiting 120 years before he poured out the flood upon the world and only eight people were saved from that flood so Amos had a mission like this it's nice to come to church isn't it to bring a nice message oh it's lovely it's so easy to bring a lovely message about love and everything's going to be alright and you're going to be blessed and all these lovely things not so easy when you've got to bring a message that where God says, I'm going to judge you. I'm upset with you. I don't like the way that you're living. I want you to change. Because then people don't like to hear messages like that. Especially in today's world of affluence and, 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 and opulence and things like that. People don't want to hear a message like that. That we're not living right and that we're not doing right. So his mission was to warn God's people of coming judgment if they did not repent. Sadly, they rejected his message. And as we look around our world today, as we look around Great Britain and the year 2014, it's still the same today. I was working in Manchester yesterday, right in the town centre. And uh, there was a march going on in the middle of Manchester yesterday. I don't know whether you were aware of it. It was called the Gay Pride March. And uh, there were thousands of people flooding the streets of Manchester yesterday. And we were caught up in it all, working right down in the, in the centre. These people were doing things that God has said in his word they're not to do. God has warned us way back thousands of years ago that when we come into our promised land, that when we come in and that we enter the land that God has given us, not to do the things that the people did before us who were in this land, lest that we should be judged also and be cast out of the very land that God has given us. Now God warned Joshua and Moses thousands of years ago, didn't he? When you go into the promised land, don't do what those people did, because if you do, I'll keep them out too. And for us in Great Britain, it's the same today in 2014. If we do the things that God says are not to be done in his word, God will be angry with us too. And he will send a prophet to us too. And he will warn us too of his coming judgment. Part of the prophecy that Amos had for Israel at that time was about a famine. And the people knew all about famine. They knew all about the famines that they've been in the Old Testament. They know all about the famines that have been years before. And so they were familiar with these things. And they uh, 
knew that God was speaking to the people when, when there was famine in the land. They knew that, that, that uh, something was afoot, as it were. And yet today, in our nation, in our town, where we live, there is a famine. It's not a famine brought by God, but it's a famine that we've imposed upon ourselves. It's a famine of the word of God. There's never been so many Bibles as there are today. It only takes the click of a mouse. Justin can do it probably in a couple of seconds of asking to click that mouse and up on the screen become a Bible. Like we've got on tonight, a Bible verse tonight. So easy, isn't it? It can happen so fast. There's even different versions of the Bible. You can have a new international version. You can have all kinds of different versions. We're surrounded by the Word of God. It's everywhere. There are Bibles at home. There are Bibles at church. There are Bibles on the internet. In fact, there are Bibles all over the place. We're surrounded by the Word of God. And yet many of the Bibles that we have today are never read. They're never opened. In fact, most of the Bibles, I suppose, in our country today are just holding up cups of tea and cups of coffee. People were there by the thousands yesterday for an ungodly march called the Gay Pride. Oh, you couldn't get, you couldn't move. There was that many people there. And yet today, sadly, the churches that God has provided for his people to work in, the churches are empty. Because there's a self-imposed famine of the word of God. They didn't choose to read the Bible yesterday, because if they did, they'd have known that the things, the very things that they were doing, were wrong according to the word of God. In fact, God left us warnings in the scriptures. He said, I've left you Sodom and Gomorrah for a warning for all time that those who do such things will come under the judgment of God. But I suppose that those, all those people used today, and there were thousands of them, they've not opened the scriptures. Otherwise they would have realized that God was not happy with the things that they were doing. And yes, there were people out there with placards, and there were people warning them. I've already heard tonight that somebody knew that there was somebody there uh, witnessing and telling those people that the things that they were doing wrong. Why then is there a famine when the scriptures are so freely available to us all? Why is there a famine when we're surrounded by all these Bibles? Why is there a famine when the word of God has never been so easy to get hold of? Or so available to us? Well our answer may be found as we compare Amos's day and Amos's famine to our own famine today. Amos was told that there was going to come a famine of the word of God, but this famine was imposed by God. He said, I'm going to stop the word of God from reaching you people. It won't come through the priest. It won't come through the prophet. It won't come through the teacher. You'll be starving for the word of God. Yes, you'll have the, the Torah, as it, as it were, or the, the scrolls that they had in those days. You'll have those things, but you'll not be able to find my word in those things. And God can do that, can't he? And isn't it true today that we can have the Bible, but we don't really know what God's saying to us? What's God saying to us tonight? I'll go to church and find out. Well, he's bound to tell me through the pastor. He's bound to tell me through the preacher. He's bound to tell me through the teacher. Isn't that the case sometimes? That we're waiting for others to get a word from the Lord for our lives? Isn't it true that that's how it is sometimes? That we're looking to other people for them to get a word for us, for our lives? Well, the Bible says that we're in a relationship, personal relationship with God. And wouldn't he speak to you first before he spoke, spoke to somebody else? And wouldn't somebody else's word only confirm what God has spoken to you? Of course it would. So why then are people doing the same as what they did in Amos' day? Dashing here, dashing there, going to this conference, going to that conference, going to this teacher, going to that Bible scholar, trying to find something from God. What's God saying to you, brother? What's God saying to you, sister? What's he saying about my life? Well, if you open the Bible and read it for yourself, you'll find out what God is saying to you. But no, it seems as if that's the last thing that we'll do in the world today. We'll go to a football match. We'll go to a gay pride match. We'll go anything, anywhere, anything, anytime. But we won't open up our Bible. The churches are empty. The football grounds are full. Why? Because there's a self-imposed famine 
of the word of God. It's not been brought by God. God's given us all these scriptures. Here, have this. Have that. Do this. Do that. We're surrounded by it. In fact, it's like being in the middle of a wheat field and you're starving and you don't touch one grain of wheat. It's just like that, isn't it? We're surrounded by all these values and yet from Monday to Saturday, nobody ever opens them. They left it. The only thing that goes on them is a cup of coffee on the top or a cup of tea from Monday to Saturday. The only time we open them is Sunday when we come to church and when the preacher reads from the Bible, then we open up our Bibles. It's a self-imposed famine of the Word of God in our nations today, just as there was in Amos's day. This is the reason why the church has been empty, because people don't avail themselves of the food that God is providing for them. There's an abundance today. We could gorge ourselves on the word of God. We're not being persecuted in any way. There's nobody coming into our churches cutting off our heads at this moment in time. But there is in other parts of the world. Some people have had the Bibles taken away from them. Some people can't read the Bible. And I'm sure that in prison or wherever they are, they'd love to be able to get hold of a copy so that they could find some comfort and some faith in God. Something to read that would encourage them in their hard situation. But we in our nation in Great Britain, we've got all these things all the trappings, we've got Bibles, we've got guitars, organs, we've got all kinds of things. And yet nobody avails himself of them. They're just lying around half the time, doing nothing. So our answer is found as we compared Amos's famine to our own famine today. One reason is that both famines had similar causes. In Amos's day, the generation had material luxury. They had material wealth. They, they were able, as I've said, to lie down on ivory couches. They were in abundance. They were everywhere. And the people were lying on them. And yet they'd forgotten all about the God who provided these things. The church, it says in Amos chapter 6, verse 1, was at ease in Zion. In other words, the church wasn't seeking God with all its heart, soul, they were searching after material things. They were searching after outward things which adorn our life on the outside. But they weren't seeking the things of the hidden man of the heart, as it tells us in the New Testament. Look around our nation today. The rich-poor gap is wider than ever. And our churches, that's the ones that are not turned into bingo halls or uh, carpet warehouses, they're empty because there's a self-imposed In fact, in Amos' day, it says in verses, chapter 8, verses 4 to 10, people couldn't wait for the religious days to be over or the services to be over. Why? So they could get back out and earn more money. They weren't interested in giving God thanks for providing all the things that God had given to them. They just wanted to get out and earn more money and do more things and live in more luxury. This is how it was in Amos' day. The search for wealth sometimes, if it's not directed correctly, will lead us away from God and not see Him. Our lives can be filled with work. I'm working in Manchester, as I've said, and next week, they're so interested in getting these flats or houses built or refurbished where we're working. They're so interested in getting them done to get the money in that they've said to us next week, you can work as many hours as you want. Not eight hours, 10 hours, you can work 12 hours, 15 hours. You can even work 20 hours if you've got the strength because we want these flats finished. That's craziness, isn't it? Where's my strength going to be then for the things of God? How am I going to be able to manage to stay awake when I'm in the services if I've been working for 10, 15, 20 hours in a day? But this is how it was in Amos' day, isn't it? The search for material luxury, the search to, to provide for this outward man, was, was going headlong, full blast, wasn't it? 100%. And as we look around our nation today, in 2014, it's the same today. Work as many hours as you want. Yes, you can work Sundays if you want. You can work weekends, work as many hours as you like. Forget about the Sabbath. It's a, just another day to earn money. In fact, now, you don't get double pay now, do you? It's just an ordinary pay now, isn't it? It used to be, double, it used to be time and a half on a Saturday and double time on a Sunday. 
but because of the greed and the corruptness of man, which is here today, just like it was in Amos' day. Oh no, we won't pay you double time now that you're a bit of It's just another day now, of course. And now we'll just give you the same pay that you get Monday to Friday. This is how our world is going at this moment. There's a character, isn't there, for you to, to, to draw you away from the things of God. There's always something to draw you away. Satan never tells you that there are consequences when you draw away. He never shows you that, does he? He only shows you the glittering things that you could have, but he never shows you the consequences of what you will have if you do go away from God. To search for wealth, to search for outward adornment, it takes us away from God, and it doesn't draw us any closer to God. Let's have a look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verses 11 to 14. This is in the days of Joshua and Moses. And they were about to enter the promised land. And God's saying to Joshua and Moses these words. When you have eaten... And are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. But then in verse 11 it says, Beware that you forget not the Lord your God in keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day. Lest when you have eaten and are full and are, have has built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and when your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, that your heart be lifted up, and that you forget the Lord your God, which has brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. What happens when our heart is lifted up? When our hearts are lifted up, they are filled with pride. And what was that march called yesterday in the middle of Manchester? That's all that they were marching in, the pride of their heart. They've drifted away from God, forsaken the commandments of God, and they're walking in their own pride away from God. It's no wonder that Mark called pride march, because that's exactly what they're doing. They're marching in their pride away from the commandments of God. If we're not walking in the light of God, Testament in John's Gospel, it says, doesn't it? Men love darkness rather than light. Let's let their deeds be exposed and let the, it be shown that the things that they've done are in vain. Men love darkness. They crave darkness. They want darkness rather than light. They don't want to come to church to have their uh, darkness exposed by the light of God's word. That's why the churches are empty. Because men love darkness. They love darkness. They don't want to walk in the light. With this indulgence all around, is it any wonder people don't meditate upon the word of God? They'd rather go and drink wine. They'd rather go and fill their natural bodies rather than the inward man with the word of God. Things got so bad in Amos' day that men wandered from coast to coast seeking a word from God. You can read it in Amos 8, verse 12. Does that sound familiar to us today? Men are wandering from this church. From that, oh, they seem spirit-filled. Let's go over there. Find out what God's doing there. And then when they get there, they realize that it's not so good there after all. Oh, they're spirit-filled. Let's go over there. Let's go to Pensacola. God's speaking to the people in Pensacola. Let's go over to Pensacola. And they get a jet and fly over to Pensacola. And they find that they're still not happy there. Why? Because they're hungry inside. They're empty inside. Just like we sang tonight, hungry I come to you. That's a good place to start, isn't it? Coming hungry to God to see what God has to say to us. Amen? But these people are wandering around because they're not feeding themselves at home. We don't just come to church to be fed. We've got to feed ourselves from Monday to Saturday. Amen? So that when we come to church on a Sunday, the preacher is only confirming what God's been speaking to us through Monday to Saturday. But so many people today, they don't do anything from Monday to Saturday, and they come into church absolutely famished. Not knowing what God's been saying to them all week, it's, it's 
are saying that to me for oh, I don't know what they're thinking. And they're confused and they don't know what God is saying. And when someone does come and speak a word into their life, they just they just believe it straight away. Yeah, that's it. That's what God is saying to me. God's told me to be a pastor. God's told me to go and evangelize. God's told me to they don't really know what God is saying, but they're only moving on what somebody's told them what God is saying. Amos 8, verses 13 to 14, describes the young men fainting from thirst. Others falling, never to rise. Doesn't that describe the lives of many Christians even today? Suffering under the lack of spiritual food. Oh, we're at church Monday to... Uh, we're at church on a Sunday, but we're doing nothing. Monday to Saturday. The Bible's closed all week. We're only holding up a cup of tea or coffee. Christians fainting easily overcome by temptation falling hit the least of life's trials doesn't that sound familiar today is this why so many young Christians fall away because they're not being grounded in the word of God two things are needed to resist the trials and temptations one is faith in God believing that he provides a way of escape but it talks about 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says if we're in a trial there's a way of escape there's always a way of escape in a trial god always provides a way of escape but we've got to have the faith to believe that he does and faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of god but if we're not reading the word of god we won't have any faith to believe that god's going to get us through the trial this is why many people crumble under pressure they start to cry and they start to sob and they don't know what what's happening in the, in the lives why has this come upon me why am i so Yes, we all go through trials, and trials are hard. But God gives us the strength and the ability to get through if we're feeding upon his word. He gives us the strength and the sustenance to get through these things. The second thing that we need to get through trials is the fear of God. The, the fear of God keeps us away from the evil that tries to trap us or ensnare us. It talks about that in Proverbs 16, verse 6. This is a healthy fear so that we will keep his commandments and walk in his ways. Matthew 13, verse 22, talks about seeds falling upon four different types of ground. And one of those seeds falls upon ground that is thorny. Let's have a look at that in Matthew 13, verse 22. also that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful isn't that what's happening that we come to church we hear the word of God the seed is planted but then we go out into the world and because of materialistic living because of the cares and the worries of this life it chokes the very word that we've just heard. And then the word becomes unfruitful in our lives. Because of all these cares and worries and trials of life, the fruit, the seed never comes to fruition. And nothing is produced in our lives. Isn't that so? Isn't that how it is sometimes? That the very word is choked out of us by materialistic living and by worries and cares of this life. Isn't that the condition? Of many churches, spiritual malnutrition brought on by materialism, immorality. We've saw in the news only the last couple of months, haven't we, about all these priests that have been uh, conducting themselves in a manner that is not godly. We're seeing it on the newspaper, aren't we? Week by week, certain people being picked out. I'm, I'm not saying that all of these people have done those things because we don't know. It's very difficult, isn't it? You've got to wade through the evidence and find out who's, who's done what weigh up all these things you know one thing the newspapers do like it's sensationalism isn't it good, uh, bad news sells papers the newspapers better than what good news does what's that saying that bad news travels around the world twice while good news is still getting its boots on and it's true isn't it we love to feed on bad news don't we we love to feed on gossip we love to hear so we can just get to the next person and tell them all about what's going on that's how we are with fleshly beings shouldn't be like that. The word of God says that we shouldn't con 
conduct our lives and stay there. By choice, many have imposed a famine upon themselves. This explains why so many people live in defeat. They don't live in victory as Christians. What can we do then about this famine? Gary, you've come to church tonight and you've told us that we're all living in famine. What can we do about it? It's not, not rocket science, is it? It's all we've got to do is open up our Bibles and feed ourselves upon the Word of God. That's my encouragement to you tonight. Why should we pick up our Bibles? Why should we read the Word of God? Well, I'm going to read that through, through a few things now, which you, are, you, you probably already know, but we need reminded from time to time. Firstly, we need to appreciate the power In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God just spoke those words. That is the power of God's word. It has the power to create things. Amen? The word of God has the power to create things. Bring things into being which don't even exist at this moment in time. That's why the devil doesn't want this word being preached. Because he knows that this word can bring into being things that don't even exist yet. And he'll do anything to shut this word up or to get this word out of your mind or to keep you from believing this word. Because he knows how powerful it is. He lived in heaven at one point. Walked up and down amongst the fiery altar stones, it says in the book of Ezekiel. Such was the place that Satan or Lucifer held in those days. So the word of God possesses the power to create things. Power in the physical realm to produce a world that we can see, but it's also got power in the spiritual realm to create things that we cannot see. I can't see the spirit that's inside Alpha or Angela. I can't see it. But there is one. There's a Holy Spirit inside her, and they have their own spirit inside her too. If I could, my spiritual eyes were open tonight, I would see that that is so. The Spirit of God has power, and he lives inside each and every believer tonight. Your trust in Christ, you have His Spirit within you tonight. Amen. John 6, verse 63 says, It is the Spirit that quickens, it is the Spirit that gives life. So the Spirit and the Word work together. The Spirit and the Word always agree together. Amen. The Word of God has power to sanctify us, the Word of God has power to make us fit to enter the kingdom. Doesn't it say in Revelation that nothing, nothing that defiles shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only that which is good, only that which is righteous. And the word of God has the power to sanctify us, to make us right for heaven, or fit to live in heaven. It tells us that in John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them, how? By your word. That's how we're cleansed, by the word of God. That's how we're made fit from heaven, by the word of God. So if we're not reading the word of God Monday to Saturday, what are we going to be? We're going to be dirty. We're not going to be sanctified. We're not going to be fit for heaven at all. We're going to be fit for no purpose whatsoever. Doesn't the word of God says that God has got different types of dishes in his house? Some dishes are for good purposes and other dishes are for not so good purposes. Which kind of dish do you want to be tonight? I know which kind of dish I want to be. I want to be, I want to be that kind of dish that's brought out when important visitors that's what the word of God does. It sanctifies us, prepares us for heaven. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. So it has power to create. It has power to sanctify. It also has power to preserve. The word of God does. It has power to preserve us, to keep us. Once we've become Christians, the word of God keeps us as Christians. Keeps us in our own natural strength. We'd have packed in years ago, wouldn't we? We'd have walked out the door years ago. But in his strength, we're strong. We're victorious. Amen? Psalm 119, verse 9 says that the young men were encouraged to keep their way pure. How? By the word of God. That's how important it is that we read the word of God because it creates, it sanctifies, and it preserves. Keeps us safe. Keeps us on the way that is right. Keeps us on that narrow path. The narrow path leads to life. It has the power of salvation, the word of God does. How does the word of salvation come to us? It comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And then it has the 
power changes from one type of person into a new type of person. A person that is fit for heaven. Amen? So it's not the power of salvation as the word of God. Now are we encouraged to read the word of God today? It does all these things. Power to create. Power to bring into being things that were never even there. Have you ever prayed something and then God brought it about and brought it before your very eyes and showed you, look, this is what you prayed for. There it is. He's done that loads of times in our family. He has the power to create. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done for you. I never said that. Jesus said that. But we must feed upon the word of God. Like newborn babies looking for their mother's milk, as it talks about in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. We appreciate the value of our daily food for feeding our bodies. And do you know what? Working 10 to 15 hours next week, if I was to do that, I'd need some food inside me, wouldn't I? <laughs> wouldn't I? But isn't it the same for the, for the spirit man as well? If he's going to do any work for God, if he's going to be playing any guitars or singing any songs or preaching, or what, he's got to be fed. Otherwise, he's going to be famished. Isn't he? Isn't that so? If he's going to be on a, a work for God, he's got to be fed too. And how do we feed the spirit man? We feed him on the food that God's provided for us, which is the word of God. That's how important it is. If you don't feed this natural man, what happens to him? He gets tired, first of all. Then he gets sick, secondly. And then what happens to him? Then he dies. If you don't feed him, he'll starve to death. He'll have man who's sick if he look like one of those prisoners in the prison camps in Germany. That's how we'll look. And that's how we'll look in the spirit too. If we don't feed our spirit man. First of all, we'll get tired in the spirit man. And we'll too tired to go to church tonight. Too tired to hold my Bible tonight. Too tired to get on my knees tonight. And before you know it, we've got no strength whatsoever. Then we start missing meetings, don't we? Oh, we missed one meeting. Then we missed two meetings. Before you know it, we missed three meetings. And before you know it, we've not been for a month. Why? Because we're not feeding the spirit man. He's getting no nourishment. We start drifting away. Then we're on the slippery slope down, aren't we? On the way away from God. This is how it is in the spirit man. Because we're not feeding him. Feeding him how? On the word of God. This is his food. Don't leave your Bibles closed all week. Open your Bibles. Feed that spirit man. And when we come to church on a Sunday like today, we all have something to share. Because we've all been reading the word of God. We've all been feeding. We'll all be full. And we'll all be giving out that which we receive through that week. Isn't that how it works? course it is. You know as well, as well as I do. Now as I've already said, it must be hard when these spiritual aids are confiscated. If somebody takes away our Bible, if somebody takes away our right to worship in peace like they're doing tonight, oh we'll miss those things then won't we? We'll miss. And we'll look back and we'll say, oh if only we were in that day when we, we, we remember when we used to be able to worship without the doors being locked and without the blinds being down. Do you remember that? How we used to worship like what we're enjoying right now, isn't it, in our nation? Freedom to worship how we like. But what if a year or two down the line from now that somebody takes away our rights as Christians to be able to worship like we worship? If somebody says you can only worship if other people and other religions can come into this church, what happens then? What happens? That's when the rubber hits the road, isn't it? When it's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When it was like Daniel, when Daniel was told, you stop praying, Daniel, or... Uh